Okay, today we're going to be looking at power. Um, it's quite a complex one, but obviously really quite important to understand. If you, before we actually get into the, the actual brief part of it itself, I'm just going to go over a little bit of background understanding for, for power. What is power? Well, you know it as watts, most likely, from the electricity meter underneath the stairs. Uh, and what that's measuring is how much energy um, you are using per second. Okay, so it's the joules per second, uh, but essentially energy is just work. So it's calculating the amount of work uh, that's being done per second. So work divided by time. So what is work? So if we put it in relation to a helicopter, um, if you want to move a rotor blade through the air, there's a certain amount of drag acting on that, so therefore we need to put an equal and opposite force in order to, to counter that drag. Uh, so it's a force, um, and the amount of work that needs to be done to counter that uh, force is the force multiplied by the distance we want to move it. So if we want to move the rotor disc all the way round in one revolution, uh, 20 or 30 meters or so, um, then that's the amount of work. So it's the drag times the distance over the time. Distance divided by time is just speed, which then gives us drag times velocity. So why is that important? So it's just so you understand that power is equal to drag times velocity. Also, if you remember that the equation for drag, so if we look at this, we've got velocity squared, which would be inside the drag section there. So you can see that the power is proportional to the velocity cubed, because we've got the V squared inside that drag equation there, times it by velocity again gives you V cubed. So power, is proportional to V cubed. So every time you increase the speed, the amount of power required, depending on what aspect you're talking about, is going to be cubed. Uh, so quite a lot of power required. Okay, so power is, and we know that drag, so that's where we're gonna start, and we're also gonna add on um, preemptively the actual curve chart for it. Okay then, to start with then, we've already talked about how uh, power is directly related to drag. So the power that we require to move the rotor blades around is all dependent on how much drag we produce. So to start with, we must understand the different types of drag. So we've got the zero lift drag, which is uh, predominantly skin friction, um, form drag, uh, which it we'll talk about in a second, and also interference. And then the other drag we have is the lift-induced drag. So uh, the induced drag that we know about from uh, the vector diagram. Uh, and on top of that, we also have elements of form drag, skin friction, and interference as well. So understanding that helps us start with the first one, which is profile power. So what is profile power? So profile power, for a start, is the uh, power required to overcome the drag when you've got zero pitch on the blade. How is that broken down? So when we look at this rotor blade, a little bit of a crude drawing, but you can see uh, this section at the front here, so this distance here, is the, the profile of the blade. When we've got zero pitch angle, the air is coming forwards, striking the front of the blade, and at the immediate front, we're gonna get stagnation and a slowing of the airflow before it then starts to accelerate over the top. But at this point, we're gonna get an area of high pressure. So this is very much simplifying it, but the main point to take away from here is you end up with an adverse pressure gradient over the blade because you're gonna end up with a higher pressure here and a lower pressure towards the rear. This clearly doesn't take into account the fact that when you're producing lift, you've got low pressure up here and high pressure down here but it's this adverse pressure gradient between the front and the back which is creating uh, the drag 
which has to be overcome with power. So when we have a blade or any kind of object in an airflow, the front profile of it now experiences what is called form drag. So the drag that has occurred due to the adverse pressure gradient caused by the high pressure at the front and the comparatively low pressure at the rear. So the profile power in this case is caused by the form drag that is caused at the zero pitch position of the blade. Note that as the blade now starts to pitch up, as we start to require more lift, it's going to create more form drag. However, that does not come under profile power. That element of uh, additional form drag is now added into the induced drag uh, when we calculate that later. So it is simply the form drag that is produced at the zero lift. So think of it like the residual form drag that is always present on this blade, no matter what speed or pitch we have applied. The next element that requires uh, profile power is the fact that if this blade was nice and light and spinning around, uh, only having to counteract this, this high pressure, that would be relatively simple. But in reality, it's connected to um, you know, a few other blades and it's on a mast, which is connected to a bearing and drive shafts, etc. And importantly, it goes all the way to back to every helicopter, which has a tail rotor. Uh, that tail rotor has also got bearings, but importantly, it's got blades on it which are turning through air and generating their own drag for various reasons. So all of that drag through the ancillary gearing and also um, the drag that's generated by the tail rotor blades also gets transferred into this blade and we need power to move it against that force even when we're at zero pitch. And so that is what the profile power is. So applying profile power now to the graph, uh, as we increase our speed, well, we need to apply that increase in speed to the zero pitch on the blade and the form drag that it creates. So we can see from the drag formula that as we increase our speed, the form drag that would theoretically be the product from zero pitch on a blade will increase as the speed increases and the power required to move that blade will actually increase by the power of three because of the power being proportional to V cubed. But that's not exactly how it works. So when we look at um, this aircraft here from the, from the top and we've got the counter rotating disc, we're going into an airflow, so we're traveling in this direction. The advancing blade has actually got a greater airflow against it or greater velocity. And so when we apply it to this equation up here, we can see that the power is gonna go up considerably. So we're going to get that exponential graph. However, on the retreating side, because the blade is traveling in the opposite direction, we're gonna get a reduction. And it's gonna be an equal and opposite reduction in velocity. But even though it's an equal and opposite reduction in velocity, because of the fact that its uh, power is proportional to the cube of velocity, it means that actually we're not going to come down in power requirement quite as much. So we're going to get an increase, which is giving us our exponential graph, but we're also getting a benefit in terms of a decrease in power, which is going to just um, make that, that power curve a little bit lighter and a little bit less extreme. Add to that the fact that as we start to increase the speed, the tail rotor, which is experiencing all the normal elements of drag, is now going to experience translational lift. Uh, if it experiences translational lift, we're removing some of the induced flow, and therefore, as we do with the main, tail, main rotors, we're going to experience less drag. So we get a, a relief from some of the drag. And also, as we do with a, you know, a normal helicopter, the tail rotor will experience flat back. Uh, most helicopters will have uh, flexible hinges on the uh, tail rotor, so the tail rotor will actually flap back as well, which will allow some of the oncoming airflow to flow up through the disc as opposed to down through it, um, which will counteract any more induced flow. 
So as you can see, the amount of drag being produced by the tail rotor is going to slowly reduce as our speed increases. So as well as that retreating blade, removing some of the drag, we're also getting a benefit from the tail rotor. So if we imagine we start to move the aircraft forwards, essentially what's gonna happen is rather than this big exponential line, we end up with something more akin to this. Until we get to a point where the tail rotor benefits have been lost. So eventually we're gonna to get to a point where we're at zero pitch pretty much on the tail rotor blades. Um, and a lot of the stability and the directional stability is being provided by the, the actual aerodynamics of the aircraft and the vertical fin. At that point, we're straight onto the advancing side blade and the um, detrimental effects of that, and we get a, a big increase. So that's profile power. The next one to look at then is induced power. Okay, so induced power is again uh, directly as a result from induced drag, which you might remember is um, as a result of the induced flow that's pushed through, down through the disc. So as a bit of a refresh for that then, so you've got your aerofoil, we've got uh, an angle of attack on this aerofoil, which has been produced by a the pitch, but also the induced flow. And what you can see here is this induced flow, what it has done is it has tilted the relative airflow to the extent where the lift vector has now been tilted backwards beyond the vertical axis. What does that mean? Well, now our lift is no longer being produced directly upwards, it's being produced backwards. Um, and we can resolve this vector simply enough to show that as a result of this lift vector, we're now getting a horizontal component just here, which is acting rearwards. And this essentially is your lift induced drag. So the induced power is the power required to overcome the lift induced drag. That's drag due to the aft inclination of the lift vector. And in addition to this, the form drag that is induced by gently increasing the pitch of the blade in order to create lift. So clearly when we are creating the most amount of lift, we'll be creating the most amount of lift induced drag. And we're usually creating the most amount of lift when we are in the high hover or the OG hover. And before we've got the benefits of translational lift uh, reducing our induced flow. So as soon as we start to get away um, from all the vortices and the induced flow, we get a rapid decrease in power required as the speed is increasing. So after translational lift, we get a continual uh, decrease in induced flow. However, it's not as quick as we would like it because we do actually have the impact of form drag as that blade starts to get pitched above the zero uh, degree pitch line in order to create more thrust, in order for us to fly faster. So the last one we look at then is parasite power. And this has two aspects. So first of all, same as with uh, most other aspects of parasite and skin friction uh, drag, as we go faster, using the drag equation again, we can see the faster we go, the more drag we're going to have uh, from all the various aspects of the aircraft. So the, the wheels, the, the, the chassis, all those sort of things, they're all going to um, add to the parasite power. Uh, but on top of that, there is a secondary effect. So the secondary factor is that if we want to go faster, because we've got this skin friction from the aircraft, if we want to go faster, what we have to do is tilt the disc forwards uh, in order to direct more of our total rotor thrust forwards and make the aircraft go faster. Well, if we tilt the disc forwards, we expose it more to the oncoming airflow. And what happens is the oncoming airflow now starts to flow down through the top of the disc. So where we had originally managed to remove a load of the um, induced flow that was going down through the disc, with parasite power, or the effect of it, we end up having to actually reintroduce an induced flow through the top of it. So we are pushing air down through the top. The effect that that has is to reduce the angle of attack that we're actually creating. And therefore, 
we're going to get that tilt of the lift vector and the total reaction from that vector diagram. And because of that, we're gonna get an increase in the rotor drag. And it's this increase in rotor drag from the um, change in the disc profile that gives us parasite power requirement. So what's that look like? So right at the very bottom then, uh, with no forward speed, we're not gonna have any kind of skin friction or parasite power requirement. But as we go faster, as per this one here, we're gonna get an exponential increase. The faster we go, the more drag we're going to encounter, and therefore the more we're gonna to need to tilt that rotor disc forward. Uh, and so we're gonna end up with a graph that looks a bit more like this. So they are the three powers that we're gonna get. And then as you might remember before, we can then average them all out to give us a single, single line. The last little top and tailing that you can do on it is you can add in our um, IG power. So we talked about it briefly. So when we are in um, ground effect, we get a reduction in power requirements. So for the induced power, we end up with less power, but then as we move away from that that nice little high pressure bubble that's reducing our power requirement, we start to have to do, need more power until we intercept our uh, translational lift drop. Okay, so now we've got our power curve, we can actually use it to identify some, some key aspects um, or key parameters within flight. Uh, so to do that, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna add an arbitrary power available line. So there's our power available line. So now we can bring out the main parameters that are useful from a, from a power curve. Okay, so now you've got your power available and your power required. So now we can pull out the various parameters that are quite useful to understand from the power curve. Okay, so starting with the first one, which is actually quite an obvious one. If this is the total amount of power that we require, and this is all the power we've got available to us, then we can see the fastest we can possibly go on here before we max out our power is at this point here where the power required crosses the power available. And this point here is your Vmax. So that's your maximum speed in straight and level flight. The next one we can talk about, the min power speed, also known as the endurance speed, a speed that we can go at where we need the least amount of power basically. The lower the power you've got, the less fuel you're gonna use and therefore the longer you can stay up in the air. So the highest power margin is the part of the curve which has got the biggest distance between the power available and the power required. And then down here we'll have our endurance. or min power speed. So while endurance speed uh, keeps us in the air for as long as possible, range speed will get you as far as possible in the same frame of time. So how do we work out uh, how to get as far as possible? Well, the higher the speed we have, the further we're gonna get in a period of time, and we want to try and use as little power as possible, because uh, that will use as little fuel as possible. So we need to find the highest ratio of speed to power, and we do that by drawing a line from the origin until it comes tangential to the power curve. And that'll get us as far down the power curve as possible, so with the highest speed, but hopefully will give us the largest power margin. Um, the last one to bring out then is the uh, best rate of climb. So the best rate to climb essentially is, is gonna be where you get the highest um, figure on your VSI, so the highest feet per minute that you can get going. So how do we get going upwards, uh, or how do we increase our rate of climb? Well, we pull collective. So therefore, in order to find uh, the, the speed that we get our best rate of climb, it's going to be where we've got the most amount of freedom of maneuver in the, in the collective, which is gonna be our highest power margin. That's the point where we can move the collective the most. So therefore, as well as our endurance or min power speed, we also have our best rate of climb. The other thing you can also look at is the limited power. And it's something just to add on at the end. So if we assume that we have uh, put ourselves in a position where we've got limited power, it doesn't matter how that is, whether it's just the atmospherics or the, the weight of the aircraft, um, 
whatever happens, we're going to have to bring down the power available. So power limited. So what effect is this going to have on you? The best place to start then with the power limited is uh, the minimum speed. So you can see here, uh, we're only managing to fly because we're sitting in the um, ground cushion and we're using all the power available. If we want to move outside of that ground cushion uh, and accelerate, well, we don't actually have the power to do that. Um, you'll see that we, we need this amount of power and we've only got that amount of power. Uh, what does that mean? This is where you're probably gonna use something like a cushion creep. And the whole point of the cushion creep is that you stay within that ground cushion uh, and therefore that's how you would creep along this power um, available line here until you intercept this section of the uh, power required line. So what does that mean? Well, it means you can see here, we've got a line where the power required crosses the uh, power limited, and that will be your minimum airspeed. The last one you can take off here then is, uh, especially person, again, if you're power limited and you're in a tight space, a field, an airfield, um, wherever you, you are, and you need to get over an obstacle at the end of the field, and you've only got a certain length of the field that you can use, uh, then you're probably going to need your best angle of climb. So best rate of climb is going to get you over a, a amount of time, it's going to get you um, to a, the highest point. But if you don't have the luxury of space, then you actually need the best angle of climb. You need to get yourself going up steeply to, to get over that obstacle. So the way we work that one out then is we use our power uh, available, so the power limited line, and we're literally trying to find the minimum speed that we can fly at that gives us the compromise of a nice large power margin. Now clearly in this particular example, when you use power limited, you can see, well, you can't just pull pitch and go vertically upwards uh, because you haven't got the power to get out of your, um, your ground cushion. So what we're trying to find is that happy medium. And once again, what we do is we draw a line that's tangential and we're trying to find the shallowest possible line. And you can see what that's done is it's given us the shortest distance possible um, along the velocity axis. So therefore it's gonna give us the, sh the lowest velocity, but you can see it's given us the, the largest power margin here. So we're gonna get the, the most amount of pull on our collective here. And that's usually around about the sort of 45 knot point. So that is pretty much all you need to add onto the graph, um, as long as you've pretty much brought out uh, the three main power principles there, um, and then highlighted the various uh, parameters that you can get from the power curve, that should be enough. But that's about it. Um, as always, if you've got any questions, comments, queries, then please um, feel free to put them in the comments below. If you've got any um, corrections or errors that you've noted, then again, put that in the comments below and I'll get it amended. Thank you very much.